I've made some abstract algebra videos in the past on my channel, but I never really cared to explain what it is, or how to work with it, or how to learn it or anything, so this is basically what the goal of this video is going to be. I'm going to introduce you to the concept of abstract algebra, enough so that you can like have some sort of understanding of it. Now it's not, it's not going to enable you to understand everything else on my channel about abstract algebra, but it'll give you a nice little introduction just so that you can then be able to learn it, like the rest of it on your own, um, just kind of to give you a little bit of a push, and just to show you what it is if you're not at all aware of it. So basically, abstract algebra is not concerned with much of the internals of what you're dealing with, it's more about the externals, okay? So what I mean by that is like in high school, you really work with the real numbers and the integers and the rational numbers and sometimes the complex numbers. You work with like, like the, the numbers inside of them. Like you're very frequently dealing with polynomials with real co coefficients or stuff like that. And you're really doing a lot with that. Now in abstract algebra, sometimes you work with polynomials and that kind of stuff. Actually, there, there are lots of times when you would work with polynomials, but what I mean is you don't really you aren't focusing on what's inside of the set, you're really concerned with the structure of what you're dealing with. And uh, I will get a little more um, a little more rigorous with what I mean by what you're dealing with, but you know. Um, so, so let's just get straight into it. So we know that the real numbers have certain properties, and I'm sure that in high school you've, um, you've seen some of these properties and you've discussed them in your algebra or calculus classes. So real numbers denoted by a um, like a double stroke r. So one property is um, actually let me do it this way. So we have um, associativity. Okay. So associativity or the associative property basically just tells us that um, we have a plus b. Uh, I'm sorry, a plus b plus c is equal to a plus b plus c. So we can put these parentheses anywhere and it's not going to matter. And of course this is equal to just a plus b plus c without any parentheses. Um, also we have multiplication. And, and so basically uh, the, the relevance of that is that it doesn't matter the, um, the order in which you actually perform the operations. It, that, that just doesn't matter. You can do it in either order. So we have addition and multiplication here. And that's because for the real numbers we have that. We have the plus and the times, which that looks weird, so I'm just going to put a small x there, okay? <clears throat> For, um, we also have the commutative property, so our commutativity, and so what that says is that um, we can exchange the order of things. So we have a plus b, this is the same as b plus a. It doesn't matter, we can flip the order, and same thing for multiplication, a times b is equal to b times a. We also have the distributive property, which it doesn't really nicely fit into either of these categories, so I'm just going to write them anyway. Uh, so we have the one that occurs on the left, so we have a times b plus c is equal to a times b plus a times c. Um, and then we also have, um, what is it, so it's a plus b times c, this is equal to a times c plus b times c. Um, and you might be like, well, okay, the only difference is one's on the left and one's on the right. Um, and it's just like, okay. Um, but yeah, this is actually a super important concept, and I'll get into that in a second. So there, there are two, uh, and they mean basically the same thing, it's just on different sides. Okay. Um, these last two categories don't fit into this plus or times thing, but I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna write them out. So we have the existence of an identity. And what that is, is something such that, like, for, actually, it, it does fit. So for, for addition, if you take a and then add zero, this is still equal to a. But if you take, uh, you can also take a and multiply it by one and still have it equal to a. So zero is what's called an additive identity, and then one is what's called a multiplicative identity. And then with that, um, often you have the existence of inverses. Okay, what an inverse is, is basically what you can do to undo something to get back to the identity. So for example, we know that a minus a equals zero, but more formally, we have, we can think of this as a plus 
negative a, okay? And so negative a is just the inverse of a. So if we add that to a, we get zero. Same thing for, multi for division, uh, for multiplication, we just use division, so a divided by a is one, but more formally, we can think of this as um, a times one over a equals one. So one over a is the multiplicative inverse of a, and when we multiply that by a, we get back the multiplicative identity. So these are the things we have for the real numbers. And um, this is a long list. We have associativity, commutativity, distributivity, identity, and inverses that exist for all, for both of the operations. That's like 10 different rules that we have here. Um, now, not all sets are like this. Um, if we take, um, well, actually, let, let's first, um, yeah, let's take the integers. The integers, they have all of these for addition, but not necessarily for, um, for like multiplication. Let me give you an example. There is no multiplicative inverse. Um, like one half, so, so like two is definitely an integer, but one half is not an integer. And since one half is not an integer, then like you don't, like the, the inverse elements are not inside of the integers. And so you have to have the identity and inverse inside of that set, otherwise it doesn't even make sense. So in this case, integers do not have a multiplicative inverse, nor do they have, uh, actually there is the multiplicative identity, but it doesn't really do anything because like, I mean, I mean it does, but like it, it just fails the inverses. Uh, and I think that's the only thing that, yeah, that, that's the only thing that it fails. Um, but let's consider something even worse. Let's consider the natural numbers, okay? So let, let's say, for the sake of this video, uh, natural numbers do not include, well actually, let's say they do include zero, um, because then what you do have is you have an additive, uh, you have the additive identity, but you don't have the additive inverses. Um, you have these other properties, um, and for this, you again, you don't have multiplicative inverses, um, you do still have the multiple, you do still have all these, and all of these, just not neither of the inverses. Um, you also, like if you exclude zero from that set, then you, you don't have the multiplicative, or the additive identity, so that's even worse. Um, but basically, so we, we're starting to form some of these ideas. How about the complex numbers? Let's see. Well, the complex numbers actually do have all of these. They do have all of these um, little, like, like, uh, axioms. They're, they're called axioms, I'm just going to tell you. Uh, they're, they're like these properties that they're just called axioms. So let me, let me just write that word. Oops. Um, because what an axiom is, uh, basically it's like a definition. So soon I'm going to give you definitions of different kinds of algebraic structures, um, and then we'll see from there. But yeah, complex numbers actually do have all of these. Um, and um, let's see, what's another one? How about the rational numbers? Rational numbers are a good one, because um, they do have all these, and they also do have these. Uh, there are actually the the additive in, uh, the multiplicative inverses. So like one half is a rational number. So all the inverses are also in, in Q. So yeah, basically these all work. Um, but these are just you know sets that we're familiar with. There are a lot of other sets that we might not be familiar with. Um, and that are like a lot weirder to work with. Um, and they will have different numbers of these things. Maybe they only have one operation. Maybe they have two, maybe three. Um, and maybe they have only a couple of these. So, so let's first look at some examples. Um, so let me, let me write it over here. So a group, so I'm gonna just give you a kind of a definition. A group is a set that contains, it's just one, one of these operations. Okay, this looks like plus or minus. I, I didn't mean that. <laughs> Let me just uh, get rid of that. Sorry about that. Um, but a group is something that has one operation and it has associativity, identity, and inverses. 
It does not, it, I mean, it could have commutativity, but that's a special kind of group called an abelian group, um, named after Abel, uh, some guy that um, was very influential in group theory. Um, so if they do have uh, commutativity, then it's called an abelian group. So that's what a group is. A ring, um, a ring is kind of, they're, they're, it depends on your definition, uh, but it has two operations. It has addition and multiplication, with one of them, which is typically addition, being the kind of the primary one, um, because it, it will have all of these properties, as well as a couple of these. So it does have identity, inverses, and associativity. Um, now, sometimes it might not have, um, I forget what it is, I, I think sometimes it doesn't have uh, an identity. So that can be a little bit problematic. Um, and then a field, a field actually contains all of these. So we know that the rational numbers, the real numbers, the, uh, the, uh, the complex numbers as well, they are all fields. The integers are not a field, they are just a, um, a, just a group. They're, they're not even a ring, okay? Because they don't, they don't have a second operation. I, I mean, they do, but it's not, um, they don't have the, uh, the inverses, so you, you can't do much with that. Um, and then there are other forms there. I think there are like semi-groups and magmas and uh, other weird things that contain different amounts of these. Um, and I think there are other types of algebraic structures that contain other, um, other like, uh, like properties and stuff. So it's really, really interesting. Um, I, I really enjoy abstract algebra. And I really encourage you to learn about it because it's a really cool thing to learn and just kind of dive really deeply with stuff like this and see what you can do with just certain axioms and theorems and postulates and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye guys.